starting the book of Philippians. This is the first chapter of Philippians. is a short book, only four chapters. This is a letter written by Paul to the church in Philippi. Now remember, Philippi was one of the cities Paul and Silas visited in Paul's secondary missionary journey, which we studied last week in Acts. It's in Philippi. Paul goes. He's imprisoned. Right? He's arrested, put in prison. During the night, they're worshiping. An earthquake comes. All the prison doors open. And the jailer comes out and discovers this, and he tries to kill himself. Right? But Paul and the prisoners haven't left. So they stop him, and then the jailer and his whole household is saved. And then Paul and Silas are released from prison, and they travel on. They go to Thessalonica, Corinth, Ephesus, other towns. And it's in these towns, Philippi, Thessalonica, Corinth, and Ephesus, that Paul later writes to later in life, and from which we get the books of Philippians, Thessalonians, Corinthians, and Ephesians. So we're starting our study of some of these letters with this book, Philippians, this letter. So some time has passed since he visited Philippi the first time, about ten years, a little more than that, and the church has grown. And Paul is writing from prison now, scholars believe when he's in prison in Rome. So he's writing from Rome in prison. And we know a few other letters of his are also written during the same time, same period. Colossians, Ephesians, uh, Philemon, they're all written while he's in prison in Rome. But this letter is different from most of Paul's other letters. Less formal, more personal, it's overflowing with emotion, the whole book is like this. You can tell Paul really loves the believers in Philippi. He really loves them. And they're very concerned for Paul because he's been in prison for several years in Rome, And we see in this letter that Paul and also the believers in Philippi are having some persecution. Paul's in prison, and then the believers in Philippi are also facing some hardship. And yet, amazingly, if there's one theme that pervades this whole letter, it's joy. Joy is the theme of this letter, I believe. In the midst of all this longing, heartache, suffering, persecution, imprisonment, beneath it all, there's this joy that's coming out, as Paul writes. Paul says in the beginning, he's praying with joy, always praying with joy, thinking about them. He talks about that even though he's in prison, the palace guard is being saved. He says that even though some people are preaching for false motives, he says, well, at least they're preaching. And he rejoices. He talks about death. He says, even if I die, it's gain. Paul is filled with joy. He's, this is the ultimate positive view of life coming out of this letter, right? <laughs> so today I want to spend a short time talking about joy. That'll be the topic for the day. Hopefully, I think this will be a little bit shorter than uh, most messages. So, before I became a Christian, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. I was in high school, when I was in high school, and to a greater extent in college, if I could sum up all of my motivations, it would be this. I wanted to feel as good as possible, for as long as possible, as often as possible. And I know most of you look at me and you think, hedonist, right? (laughs) Yep, that's me. But in all seriousness, that was me, right? That's what I wanted. If I'm really honest with myself, that's what I was after. And for me, that pursuit of that kind of just feeling good as often as possible, as much as possible, that only ended when I realized that I couldn't actually get it. I couldn't actually hold on to it. It was increasingly elusive for me. And so, sometime during college, uh, with a great degree of back and forth, I returned to God. God I knew from my childhood. But while I was in college, I was studying engineering, and I learned about this man named Blaise Pascal. Some of you might know him. He's a French mathematician from the 17th century. He established a lot of uh, uh, laws. One of them is called Pascal's Laws, or a lot of theorems, and this is a famous one. It has to do with hydrostatics and pressure, so I learned about him in physics. But he was also, and I didn't find out this until later, a devout Christian. He had a dramatic encounter with the Lord, devout Christian, wrote a great book called Pensies, Um, And he wrote this. All men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. You know, I think Pascal is right. Maybe happiness is too weak of a word, though. See, I wanted more than happiness. I still do. I want like deep happiness, right? Fulfillment, right? Happiness overflowing. Contentment. I want to be completely content with everything that's happening. I want to be excited. I want excitement. I want incorruptible, unending ecstasy and clarity, right? What's a word that can sum up all those things? Maybe. Maybe a word would be joy. Maybe joy is the right word to use. 
So let's use that word to, to kind of encapsulate all those things. And I think the first thing I want to say, the simple truth is, we need joy. We need those things. We are built for those things. It's in our nature. We have a great capacity to experience joy. And we know this not only because of all these moments of great happiness, but also because of the moments of great emptiness. Right When we're empty, we feel that capacity. I think we're tempted to, to believe that God, what he wants for us is to be dispassionate, right? Give up all this sensuality, desire, passion, and instead just be nice. Be nice and safe, right? But I don't believe that. I think in reality, God's goal is not to lessen our passions, but to redirect them. Listen to what C.S. Lewis says. This is amazing. If we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospel, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. So God's goal is not for you to desire less, but for you to desire more. For you to want more. More from life. More joy. More fulfillment. Why does God want that? Why does God want you to want that? Because when you start desiring that kind of joy, that kind of fulfillment, you'll quickly realize that you can't get it. Right? It doesn't exist. At least not in the world. In fact, it only exists in one place. One person. So God isn't telling you not to seek happiness. He's just telling you to seek happiness in Him. Because that's the only place where you'll find it. When Jesus, Jesus is describing the kingdom of God, right? He's describing the kingdom of God. Look what He says. In Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. That's a call to do what? Trade what we have for something better. Trade the lesser good that we have for the greater good. To recognize that all our pursuits, all our efforts to be happy are really misguided attempts to find for ourselves the joy that we need that only God can give. And that's the second point. We need joy, and then that joy is only found in Jesus. And the great news is, He wants us to have that joy. He wants to give it to us. You know, in the beginning, in the garden, right, after creation, Adam and Eve are given all the trees of the garden to eat from. Right? Eat from any of the trees in the garden. Except for one tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were forbidden to eat from that tree. It's the only rule. One rule. Don't eat from that tree. Of course we know they ate from the tree and here we are. (laughs) But look what it says in Genesis. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Something about that was pointed out to me recently that Eve is recognizing good things in the fruit. Right? She says the fruit was good for food, pleasing to the eye, desirable for gaining wisdom. See, they saw that and they thought God was holding out on them. They thought there was something good that God was keeping them from having. And they didn't trust him. And we do this today. We are tempted the exact same way. We want something, something we believe will make us happy. And when God tells us no, we tend to think he doesn't care about us, us being happy. He doesn't want us to be happy. But the reality is, God is working for our joy always. Always. So the Bible says, in Psalm he says, No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. No good thing. We can trust him. We can trust him to provide entirely for our needs, especially our need for joy. It took me a long time to trust God that way, though. I remember one time, I'll tell you this story, I was in Thailand with uh, YWAM, I was doing a YWAM DTS, and um, <clears throat> my friend and I were riding on the back of a truck with about 20 Thai kid people, and uh, it was very unsafe to do, <laughs> but we were on the back of this truck, and we were driving over a bridge over some water, and we were talking about how back in the States, uh, he, my friend would jump off bridges, you know, really tall bridges into water, and it was an exciting thing, and I had never really done it, but I wanted to. I really wanted to, so we were talking about that. 
Well, a few weeks later, we're riding our bikes in Vietnam, of all places, and we randomly come across this railroad bridge. And there are probably 20 Vietnamese kids jumping off the bridge into the water below. So we are like, this is perfect. Let's join them. So we go and we join them. None of us, we don't understand anything they're saying. They don't understand us. But they direct us and we climb to the top of the bridge. It's about 45 feet above the water. So pretty, pretty high. Never jumped off anything that high in my life. I carefully walked to the edge of the beam. <laughs> it was like a, you know, half a foot wide. And I just immediately jumped off because I was terrified. <laughs> if one thing I learned from doing that is that you go a lot faster than you think you're going to go when you're up there. Man, you accelerate. <laughs> so it was a terrifying, very painful, not very painful, slightly painful, uh, but most of all incredibly fun. Incredibly fun. But you know what the best part of it, the whole thing was for me? The best part of it was that I realized God cared about me. We were looking for adventure, and God orchestrated it. He provided it. He designed it. For no other reason than he wanted to. I didn't even ask him for it. He just heard us talking and did that for us. Listen to these verses from Psalm. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Listen to this, what Jesus says. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Some of you know Brittany and I's story, and I tell it probably every week. So I'm going to keep doing that until someone tells me to stop. (laughs) I'm going to give you some more details about it, because it's great. (laughs) When I first started pursuing Brittany years ago, I really didn't think we were going to end up together. I wanted to be with her, don't get me wrong, but I didn't believe it would actually happen. God told me to pursue her, ask her out. But I figured, you know... For whatever reason, God was doing that. It certainly wasn't that we would end up being together. <laughs> and frankly, the main reason is Brittany was just too beautiful for me. And that sounds humble, but in reality, it's just how I was thinking. I was like, Brittany's just out of my league, right? At one point, at one point when we were dating, this is true, okay? I'm not like trying to be poetic or anything, okay? I literally thought about it and I was like trying to figure out if there was any girl I knew that was more pretty than Brittany, and more beautiful than Brittany, and I couldn't. I literally could not think of anyone. And I'm not trying to be poetic. Again, this, I was doing this not out of like some kind of romantic idea of poetry. I was just, for some reason, going through this exercise to think about how ridiculous it was that God would have me ask out this girl. So I remember too when we got engaged, after we were engaged, On two separate occasions, two separate people said to me, Great job, Trevor. You're really batting out of your league. (laughs) In the moment, I was so happy anyway just to be engaged that I didn't care. And I kind of really just agreed with them. I was like, yeah, you're right. (laughs) You see, the great thing about that is I really wanted to be married. For a long time, I wanted to be married. But I just wanted a girl. I just wanted to be married. But God wanted to give me the most beautiful girl that I knew. That's what God wanted. See, the truth is, and what I now realize, is God wants our joy more than we want it. He has plans to give us more than we have the courage to ask for, more than we expect, more than we can imagine. If you're like me, it might take take you a long time to trust God this way. But Paul, in this letter, gives a great promise. He says, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. You know, through this letter, Paul is filled with joy, right? But he also is suffering, and he expresses deep longing. Listen to these. He says, he longs to be with the believers in Philippi. He says, God can testify how I long for all of you, the affections of Christ Jesus. He wants to be with Jesus. I desire to to depart and be with Christ. And he's in prison, right? He's suffering. And this is our experience, too, right? We go through life, and oftentimes... Our hope is deferred. What we want to happen is not happening yet. Things are delayed. And there's a longing anyway that can't be satisfied. There's a deep and lasting joy that we want that we can't seem to hold on to. We only get glimpses of it. And yet we see here that Paul is, despite his suffering, rejoicing. How? How is that possible for him to be doing that? 
In verse 19 he says, For I know that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Paul believes that in the end, it will all be worth it. All his efforts, all the pain, will be worth it. Paul is looking forward to a joy that's coming, but that's not yet fully here. But he knows it's coming. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is from Hebrews, talking about Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. See, Jesus went to the cross because he knew the joy that was waiting for him on the other side. He saw all the untold joy that would result from his willingness to go to the cross. And he looked forward to it. He was willing to suffer for it because he knew how great that reward would be. That's the same joy that allows Paul to endure suffering and even have joy. He's tasting that joy now, even in the midst of being in prison. And that's the final thing I want to say. The joy of Jesus, the joy that Jesus offers us, that God is trying to give us, is so great that no suffering can diminish it. No delay will take it away from you. Nothing that happens can take it from you. Remember Pascal, Blaise Pascal, I quoted from earlier? Well, after his death, he died, and they found in his jacket lining some words stitched into his jacket lining that he carried with him everywhere he went. And it was this powerful conversion story that he had, his conversion story. He had this, this really dramatic, poetic language, and he carried it with him everywhere he went. And in it, he wrote this, at one part of it. Joy, 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 tears of joy. Everlasting joy in return for one day's effort on earth. You see, I think what is so key to all of this is that we need to remember this, home, this place is not our home. This life is not it. We live our whole lives in the moment, now, today, right? We live our whole lives right now. But tomorrow is coming. And in tomorrow, there'll be joy. The joy we're looking forward to. The joy we want but we can't seem to hold on to. It's coming. It's inevitable. We need to live with that in mind. Knowing that. Convinced of that. Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble. You certainly do. And the only thing that's going to get us through is that we have a real, tangible understanding of heaven. We need to have a clarity and a certainty about the joy that is right around the corner because it changes the way we live right now. Paul had that. See, Paul, he's talking about dying like it's nothing. He's, he knows he could die any time. And he says, if, I'm, if I die, I just go to be with Jesus. So what does it matter? And if I stay here, I get to be with you and help you. So I'm happy, Right? But to us, I think heaven is heaven's an afterthought. I know for me, for the longest time, I didn't really want heaven. Right? John Eldridge wrote this great book called The Journey of Desire, and in it, he talks about heaven. And he says, if you don't genuinely desire heaven, you won't be able to tap into the incredible joy that heaven brings. And so you won't have what you need to live right now. And the problem is, I think we just have a weird view of what heaven's going to be like. Right? What do you think heaven's going to be like? What do you think of when you imagine heaven? I heard this great comic strip. And I'm going to try to translate it. It might not work, but I'm going to try. I thought it was perfect for this. So a guy is in heaven. And he walks up to God. God's floating and he says, excuse me, God. God turns around. Yes, my son. <laughs> he says, is there a billiards table here? <laughs> and God looks at him and says do you really need a billiards table? <laughs> the guy says, well, I guess not. And God turns away, walks away. And he's just sitting there and looking down. He's like, this sucks. <laughs> Is that your view of heaven? Do you really need that? Do you really need an electric guitar in heaven? <laughs> this sucks. <laughs> I used to think that all we would do in, is he, in heaven is sit on clouds and sing songs all day long. Right? That was my picture of heaven. I really thought that's what heaven would be like. you know. And that's just not very exciting to me, to be honest. <laughs> if, that's, if that's what your view of heaven is, if your ultimate destination is something that you don't desire, then you're going to want to be like, man, i got to cram in all the fun I can get right now because I'm going somewhere where it's not going to be fun and exciting and, you know. But that is a terrible, inaccurate view of heaven, right? It's 
not what the Bible teaches. People are surprised to know that in Revelation it says God is bringing a new heaven and a new earth. That's what the end brings. A new heaven and a new earth. And we'll have bodies. We're given new bodies. Whatever the earth, the new earth will be like, it will be more real, more tangible than this earth. You know, I spent a lot of my single life, before I was married, wanting to be married, right? That was what I did with my time. I just wanted to not be single anymore. That's what I did with my single life. That's a terrible way to use your single life, by the way. (laughs) But I realized recently that now that I'm married, I probably won't be able to do some of the things that I could have more easily done when I was single. So, for example, I want to take a motorcycle trip across Thailand. I kind of, you know, looked into it a little bit, and you can do it. People do it. Just go on a motorcycle and ride across Thailand. Awesome, very cheap, but it will take a month or so, you know? So I don't see any time in the near future where I'll be able to do that. It's hard to take a month off, especially when you're expecting kids. (laughs) So I might not be able to do it. I might not be able to do it ever. Maybe I will, but maybe not. But you know what? It doesn't bother me anymore that I won't be able to do that or I might not be able to. Why? Because I know that I'll get to do it at some point. I'm convinced that I'll have an eternity that's just around the corner where the whole universe is given to us for our enjoyment. That's what God has promised to us, to give us the kingdom, he says. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So when that happens, I'll ride across the new Thailand. Right? If you don't have a vision of heaven like that, you'll find yourself very concerned by the fact that you might miss out on some pleasure or enjoyment here on earth. And because your God-given need for joy is so deep, you'll be in a position where you might make a self-destructive decision because you think the only way you'll be able to get that joy you need is by getting it now. So I'm going to close with this. Let me give this illustration. This might sound cliche, right? But the clearest picture of heaven I've ever gotten was my wedding day. And I think that's probably closer to the truth than we realize, right? The Bible says in Revelation the world will end with the wedding, the marriage of Christ to his church, right? Well, for me, it was the best day of my life. I know that's cliche, but it really was. I jokingly say it's the best day of my life. Every day now is just downhill from, from that point. <laughs> that's not true, but. I think it's kind of funny. But you have to understand, though, the entire way leading up to the wedding, for me, the years leading up to that was really difficult. You know, if you guys know me, if you walked with me through that time, you know that I went through a lot of heartache, a lot of confusion, a lot of disillusionment, a lot of anger at God. That was the path God took me on. And strangely enough, it was the more difficult road that took me to the greater joy I'm grateful now that God desired my joy more than I did. He pushed me on even when I didn't understand. And it was a great day. What joy. All my friends and family and the girl I love together. And all the work, all the heartache, all the pain, it all culminated in a moment of joy. And all the difficulty that preceded it disappeared. All the pain passed away and all that was left was joy. That's what heaven will be like. You know, after the wedding, I was reflecting on all that had happened, and I had this thought that, finally I can rest. The journey's over, I don't have to do that kind of journey again, right? But I've reconsidered that. <laughs> Shortly after the wedding, I wrote, I wrote this, and I'll read it to you. I realize now that the journey of pursuing Brittany is a parallel for the life we now live together. I can see the path laid out before us, and I know that on this road my heart will still be broken, my hope will falter, my faith will be tested, I will not understand, I will be angry, and I will be hurt, and yet I know that at the end of this life, at the end of this journey, I will walk into my wedding, and all my friends and I will share in a great abundance of love himself, and in one moment we will trade all our pain and fear for joy, and all will be redeemed." The fact is, whatever hardship we face will ultimately be redeemed and used to increase our joy. How do I know that? Because the most heartbreaking act of cruelty and defeat that ever occurred, the death of Jesus, is now the instrument by which all of creation is redeemed. And now that redemption is offered to us 
to follow Christ, to unite our sufferings with his, so that even the worst that we face will be redeemed and undone, and used in the end only to further increase our joy and the joy of others. My wedding day, the great gift that God gave to me, it's but a foretaste of the the wedding. The wedding the whole earth longs for. The wedding we're all looking forward to. Where all our pain and fear and hurts will be overcome by the joy of the bride and her bridegroom. And Jesus will say to us, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Let's pray.